Welcome to my introductory guide to the Game Boy Wars series. This video will cover the unique units and mechanics present in the Game Boy Wars series. That is, Game Boy Wars 1, Turbo, Turbo Famitsu, and Game Boy Wars 2. All four are identical in gameplay and are much closer to Advanced Wars than the potentially overwhelming overhaul the series saw in Game Boy Wars 3. I can't say I fully recommend actually playing through these aside from possibly Game Boy Wars 2, because the original Game Boy Wars has very slow gameplay, and though Turbo and 2 improved it quite a lot, they still haven't aged all that great. The reason I'm making this video is because the more research I do on these strange, old, unknown titles, the more I realize just how innovative they actually were. Game Boy Wars was more influential for Advanced Wars than you might think, and there are some creative ideas that still haven't been revisited. So this video is here in case anyone wants to, say, get them to actually create Advanced Wars 5. So yeah, even if you never play Game Boy Wars, this video should make for interesting documentation if nothing else. Huge shoutouts to the Japanese site Game Boy Wars Network for documenting all of this. I had to Google Translate the pages, but I got the gist of everything. So, to begin with, the game rules are similar to Super Famicom Wars, except with a hex grid. Supplies cost money, you can only build out of properties three spaces from the HQ, you can build ground units out of cities, and direct combat units fire at each other at the same time instead of one at a time. There's no luck damage, but it seems that the attacker always does an extra half HP of damage. Infantry, for example, do 45% to other infantry, so if one infantry at full health attacks the other, the attacker will have one more HP than the defender after combat. Also, units counterattacking a foot soldier will deal the combined damage from both the primary and secondary weapon. Strange, but it's there. Only really applies to Tank A and the B-Copter by the look of the damage chart. Capturing is also a little different. Cities have 20 capture points like usual, but unit building properties have 30 and the HQ has 40. Capture points do not return to the maximum when the foot soldier leaves the building, so you could wait until the enemy has a neutral building down to one capture point, blow him up, and then swoop in with your own infantry to finish the capture. Transporters have a few odd properties. 1. Loading anything into the transporter will use up its turn if it hasn't already moved. Second, if the transporter is damaged, units inside it will take the same amount of damage, so watch yourself. Finally, I doubt anyone ever hits the unit cap in Advance Wars, but in Game Boy Wars it's 40 units instead of 50 units. When you start a game with a computer, you can choose between Red Star and White Moon, and then you'll have to clear every map in the game before arriving at the final three maps. First up are the normal maps, which are the same for both sides, the special maps, which may vary depending on what side you're playing, and finally, the final three maps, which are exclusive to one side or the other and are loaded with tons of pre-deployed units. Beat all of these to see the ending. Game Boy Wars Turbo Famitsu only has eight maps in total, six normal and two final maps. All of these were sent in by readers of Famitsu Magazine in Japan, making it the first game to feature user-created content. In Game Boy Wars 1, there are unique maps for player vs. player battles. In Game Boy Wars Turbo, player vs. player is disabled entirely, for some reason. Player vs. player returns in Game Boy Wars 2, but there are no unique maps for player vs. player only. However, Game Boy Wars 2 also has the first map editor for the series, allowing you to create your own maps. This game can interact with Hudson's KISS system, which probably won't be relevant for most players. It was also going to interact with the Nintendo 64 iteration of the series, but that game was unfortunately cancelled. Also of note in Game Boy Wars 2 is one of the craziest features I've ever seen in this franchise. It is called Reverse Mode. When you see the ending in the other games, that's it, game over. But in Game Boy Wars 2, the campaign starts over in Reverse Mode, which modifies the gameplay depending on what side you're playing. If you're playing Red Star, Reverse Mode doubles all damage dealt by both sides. If you're playing White Moon, Reverse Mode makes the max HP 20 for all units. Units still start at 10 HP, but through joining, you can increase it as high as 20. If you want to try this out without beating the game, there are cheat codes to help you there, and you can activate them from either side if, say, you want the max 20 HP mode while playing as Red Star. Oh, and, um, Reverse Mode is a term I came up with. It's probably not the best, but another mode or back mode sounded too dumb. 
Anyways, onto the units. Now keep in mind that I use the traditional unit names in this video, but the English patches available are similar to the one for Game Boy Wars 3 in that they name units after real-world vehicles, so keep that in mind. If you're familiar with Super Famicom Wars, you've got a head start as most of the units function the way they do there. Infantry, mechs, and tanks haven't changed, but the APC doesn't supply like it does in Advance Wars, instead it has a gun, and supplies are handled by the supply truck which can only refuel ground units and Fighter B. What is Fighter B? It's essentially the duster from Days of Ruin. Less attack power than Fighter A, but cheaper. Anti-air vehicles are in this game but cannot fire on ground units. There are also three ground-to-ground -ground indirect units. Artillery B and the Rocket Launcher both have a range of 2 to 3 in this game, and Artillery A has a range of 2 to 5. Artillery B does more damage to armored units, while the Rocket Launcher does more damage to unarmored units. For some reason though, Artillery B was removed from Game Boy Wars 2. Finally, the Transport Copter in these games has a weak machine gun equipped and carries any two foot soldiers, not just one. Leaving Navy units aside for the time being, let's talk about units exclusive to these games, starting with the Gun Battery, or Turret, or whatever you want to call it. This is the strongest indirect in the game, with a range of 3 to 6 and lots of power, but watch out, the unit only has one unit of fuel in the gas tank, meaning it can only move one space per turn before having to refuel and is restricted to roads. However, transporting it is possible if you move it onto, and I am not kidding you, a supply truck. My gun turrets are being carried by a dinky little supply truck. <laughs> wow. As for the other exclusive ground unit, if you thought Tank B and Tank A weren't enough, get ready for the immortal Tank Z. It's like a mega tank, only it's armed with a first ever direct indirect hybrid cannon. The range is one space if it moves, but if it doesn't move, the range is one to three spaces, which is less than its movement power of four, but eh. The real problem is that it's only able to be produced on the final three maps of the game, unless you pre-deploy it in a custom map. And Tank Z isn't the only unit to have this restriction either. The other unit with such a restriction is the Super Missile. You can compare this to the Black Bomb from Advance Wars DS, because its only attack is to explode, but the Super Missile is even more nuclear, because it instantly destroys anything in the blast radius, and the Hex Grid means that its range of three spaces covers quite a large area. Again, without being pre-deployed, it's only available in the final three maps, and its price point is enough to cause Kanbei to commit seppuku. 77,000 gold! Jeez! Oh, and if the Super Missile is your only unit remaining and the explosion destroys all remaining enemy units, you win the map, just in case it ever comes to that. There's another new air unit, and this one is even more wild. The Radar Helicopter is a unit only available in Fog of War battles and has a massive vision range, as well as the ability to carry any two ground units. Before there were recons, there were Radar Helicopters, apparently. You can only load units into radar helicopters at airports and on roads, so keep that in mind. This thing costs the same as the T-Copter and can even load a supply truck carrying a gun battery. That's impressive. You have to play Fog of War to use it, but it's such a fantastic transport option. Maybe even too fantastic. You can also pre-deploy it in custom maps. Finally, we have the Navy units. There's only four of these, so it won't take long to go into detail on all of them. The battleship is the usual, except it can fire on literally anything thanks to its anti-air missiles. The lander carries two ground units and has a cannon for attacking anything but submarines. Just don't expect much damage from it. Speaking of the submarine, it can't dive in this game and attacks only navy units, but it's a direct-indirect hybrid just like Tank Z, with a movement of 4 and a range of 1 to 3. The aircraft carrier, however, is worth a paragraph or two. It's similar to the carrier in Advanced Wars DS, but this one can repair the two air units you have on board. It's also got anti-air missiles with the same range as the battleship. The highlight is there's actually a kind of exploit you can do with the air unit repair function. See, these games let you turn off the automated repair and refueling of units on properties. If you do, there will be a command on the menu to activate this function manually, but it won't work for units that have taken their turn already. This was implemented because fuel and ammo cost money in these games. The exploit is that units on the aircraft carrier get repaired and refueled regardless of whether they've taken their turn or not. 
If auto supply is off, you can move air units onto the carrier, use the supply command, then on the next turn, use it again at the start of the turn, and the air units can get off the carrier with 4 more HP than they had normally instead of the usual 2. Of course, whether you use it or not depends on if you even bother with the aircraft carrier, but it's worth keeping in mind if the map demands it. There are maps with pre-deployed aircraft carriers that they really want you to use, so there's that. That concludes my overview of the Game Boy Wars series units and unique mechanics. Even if you never play these games, I hope I've provided an interesting bit of history. These were definitely important games in the greater scope of Advance Wars, so special thanks to Hudson for developing them. Until next time.